Welcome to my second ever EMF camp talk. Um, I, spoke, I spoke here in 2012 on women in computing and uh, they asked me to come back but I didn't really want to talk about the women's stuff again so I thought I'd talk about something else with a subtext of ranty women's stuff just for fun. Um, so this is a talk about working with school kids and trying to get school kids excited about computer science and about computing and about computational thinking and about coding and that kind of stuff. Um, but before I go into any detail about that, I guess the question I should probably address is, who am I to tell you about this stuff? Um, there might be some school teachers in the room, there might be some people who know a lot more about this than me. Um, so I thought I'd give a quick overview of the kinds of things that I've done in this particular domain. So um, for about the last 10 years, I've been doing stuff with uh, schools outreach from my job as a lecturer in computer science. So as it's part of the university's outreach mission to go into schools and engage with school kids. Um, it's also, probably shouldn't talk about this as much, but it's also part of our marketing because if people go into schools and do a good show, it kind of advertises the university. Um, and it's also huge fun. So I've been on the project Technocamps, which was a massive European project looking at, we went into every school in Wales, I think, with that project. Um, I had a much smaller project called GAUS, which stands for Get On With Science. And that was kind of fun, and that involved doing all sorts of things with the local school. Um, I'm a STEM ambassador, so I work with schools in that way. I'm gonna talk a bit more about that particular aspect later. Um, I have this Android programming day, which I wrote, which has been run, I think, about 200 times now. It's a Creative Commons workshop. You can just download it and run it if you want to do it. Um, and I'm on the, this playful coding project, which is looking across Europe at getting playful activities to engage kids with coding and with computation in a creative and kind of open and playful way. Um, and finally, the one in the bottom, ARC, is the Aberystwyth Robotics Club which is an after-school club where we get nerds in and we build robots and then sometimes they fight the robots or sometimes they don't, depending upon what kind of robot it is. And that picture at the top is, of course, me with my first computer. Um, so, right, that's who I am to tell you about this. I know quite a lot about computers, I know quite a lot about schools, and I know quite a lot about doing stuff, with, which is fun. Um, so, um, in order to convince you that this kind of activity is worthwhile, I think it's important to sort of take a step back and think about why, why would you even bother trying to engage kids with this kind of stuff? Um, there's a sense in which computing is more, more embedded in the curriculum now, so schools are doing more of this stuff, but it's not necessarily done in the most entertaining or engaging way, and I think it's kind of important to see computing not just as a means of getting a better job, although that is a, obviously a motivation for a lot of people, um, but also something that kind of gives you a cognitive toolkit for dealing with other kinds of problems. And this, this concept, computational thinking, was introduced by Jeanette Wing um, in a little article called Computational Thinking. You can find it in the communications of the ACM. It's actually really easy to read. It's only like three pages or something, but it blew my mind when I read it the first time. It's really concise, and it talks about how being computationally literate gives you a new toolkit for dealing with the world. So you approach problem solving in a different way. There's ideas of algorithms, there's ideas of sequences, there's ideas of control that you use when you're debugging a washing machine as much as when you're debugging some code, yeah? Um, the idea of sensors and responses and reactions and looping and scale and abstraction, all of these things are absolutely core to computing and computer science. And they're also core to um, science in general. And maybe it's just because I'm a bit of a nerd, but they're the kinds of concepts that I use in my everyday life as well. Um, not that I'm the kind of person that writes an algorithm for making a cup of tea, but you get the kind of idea, yeah? Um, so computational thinking, if we don't teach our kids this stuff, then they're missing out on something that's actually really useful for them as a kind of way of interacting with the world. So that's reason one to do this, yeah? Um, the second reason to do this is that computing is an inherently fun activity. Um, and if you're teaching computing through the medium of spreadsheets, 
I think you might find that difficult to convince people of. But if you're teaching computing through the medium of something like Scratch, then actually there's some really cool, fun things you can do with it. So I've made the huge mistake of clicking a link on a Windows machine. Ah, oh, here we are. So this is a, a, a gallery of projects that were inspired by a visit to the Salvador Dali Museum. And um, they're just animations, and they're just silly animations that um, enable you to play with the concepts of Dali's paintings. And it's a kind of Dali hackathon that we did. But it's just, it's playful, it's interesting, it's exciting, it's artistic. It's nothing to do with spreadsheets, but the kinds of concepts that you're working with when you're doing this kind of stuff are the kinds of concepts that you can then later apply in different... Yeah, thanks for that. Okay. <sighs> right. So, yeah. I, I had to borrow a laptop because my laptop's too old, and the presentation stuff doesn't have uh, a VGA connector. <laughs> and my laptop doesn't have anything else. So um, I'm not normally this technologically incompetent, I assure you. OK, so computer science is fun, right? When you're, when you're programming, you're quite literally building things out of ideas. And I can't think of anything more exciting than that when it works well, or anything more frustrating than that when it doesn't work well. But unless people get the chance to try it, then they're not really going to be able to know whether they're the kind of people that would enjoy doing it. So we have to kind of show people the, the playful and creative side of these things. Um, having said that um, the whole getting a good job thing is not a major motivator, um, you don't have to be motivated by money to be concerned about the fact that the number of buckets of money that come in has got to be slightly larger than the number of buckets of money that go out, right? Um, so um, the fact that c computer science leads to a reasonably good job in many cases is a reason to try and push this in our schools, um, particularly for, um, particularly with groups that don't necessarily engage with computing, which is going to bring me neatly on to my next slide, where I stop and have a bit of a rant. Um, I don't know what the gender ratio is at AMF camp. Um, I haven't asked for the figures, but I'm going to guess it's about 20% women, because it feels a bit better than normal for me. Um, just looking around the place and walking around the place. And computer science, generally, you're looking at 15%. And that, that's pants, uh, particularly given the fact that computer science is a, is, a, is a discipline that leads to good jobs, particularly given the fact that computer science is something that's fun, particularly given the fact that computer science can be really creative and really uh, exciting. Um, uh, but we ha we're in a situation where girls just aren't getting involved. They're getting turned off it, and they're getting turned off it really early. Um, so that's the other reason, particularly women, should be engaging with this stuff. You can't be what you can't see. So if everybody they s kids see who's doing computing is a guy, then you're going to assume that computing is something that's done by guys. Um, so I think it's kind of important to kind of encourage the kids to think about doing this really quite fun and exciting thing because it might get them money, it might get them a rewarding job, but it might not be for them. But at the moment, they're not even getting the chance to see whether it's for them. So um, that's my kind of why. Um, <clears throat> the next bit of this talk is a kind of a section which I think of as how. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through some different types of engagement activity that I do, and then talk about the pros and cons of each one with regard to well, getting the kids on board, yeah? so. Um, the, the first thing I want to talk about is the Aberystwyth Robotics Club. Um, the Aberystwyth Robotics Club is an after-school club for kids from the local secondary schools. We take kids from 11, and we've got a group of beginners and we've got a group of advanced kids. And this is a set of the beginners with some of our student ambassadors. Um, the two, two students you can see, three students you can see standing there are all undergraduates with us who help out in the club. So they get quite a lot out of it as well. Um, we have a kind of project-based approach for the, for the little ones. So the 11, 12-year-olds follow a kind of curriculum, and the, the, the older kids do whatever they want. So the, the robots the little ones were building are these little, we call them magician chassis, because that's the make of the chassis. And they've got a scoop on the front, which lifts up and down with a, 
an actuator and they've got motors and they decorate them themselves with googly eyes because everything looks better with googly eyes. And the, the aim is you do a little robot course and you lift up the scoop and everything. And it's all about building it, programming it, designing it, decorating it, painting it pink, that kind of stuff, yeah? Um, so that's the newbies, yeah? Um, the advanced kids, this, they basically do what they want. So this is a Cyberman head that someone got from a garage sale or a boot sale or something. Um, and it's got uh, some NeoPixel eyes that change color depending upon how close things are. Uh, it's got a Raspberry Pi with a Pi cam. And you can see the blue, the blue thing on the screen behind it is um, the view from inside the Cyberman's head. And we're going to get face recognition. We've got the face recognition working, and they've got a voice changing thing, and they've recorded some Cyberman voices. So you, you walk up to it, and it'll do a Cyberman voice if it sees your face, which is, for a 14 year old, apparently really exciting. Um, uh, other projects, we've got Joseph, the Technicolor 3D printed robot. Um, his arm's fallen off, it's on the table next to him. Um, I don't know if you can see, there's a sort of model's head with some glasses. Those are ultrasonic glasses for the blind that a couple of 15-year-old boys are building where they tell the distance and play sounds in your ears to see which one's further or nearer. So that's kind of cool as well. Um, so that's Robot Club. And it's brilliant. It's exciting. It's probably the best two hours of my week. Um, most weeks. Don't tell my husband. Um, but the... The thing is, you see, we, we wanted to get a new, lot of newbies in uh, in September. So I said, I want 50-50. I said, I want, I want 10 girls, I want 10 boys. That, 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 for me, is the perfect gender ratio for a robotics club. So we went into all the local schools. And it wasn't me going into the local schools, because I'm aware that I'm not the most girly of girls. Uh, we, got, we got Katie. She's a third-year physics student. She's proper, super robotics person and she's also very very good at being girly and she was the one that went in and she said we want 10 boys we want 10 girls and we, we want everybody to apply and you fill in the form and everything and at the end of the recruitment phase we had I think 26 guys and three girls so we went for 10 boys and three girls because that would be better than making the ratio even more skewed and you think, ah, why? These are 11 year olds, yeah? Why are they put off so early? How does this happen? How does this happen? So, I mean, I think this is kind of like code clubs, yeah? And you quite often get this with code clubs as well. And um, what you've got going on with clubs in general is that they're massive fun to run. And for someone like me, who's a proper nerd, it's really good fun to be with other people who are young and just finding this stuff out. And it doesn't really matter if they're boys or girls, really. But and you have really high impact on some kids, yeah? So the, 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 the 30 kids who come to Robot Club, they are learning so much, so quickly. And you wouldn't believe how quickly an 11-year-old can pick things up if they've got an individual undergraduate helper sitting next to them. They just race ahead. But you're only ever dealing with the ones that are already keen, yeah? You're dealing with the people who are already part of the in-club. And getting the girls in, we've really worked at that this year and we haven't succeeded, so... That's my thought about engaging through clubs. I'm going to continue doing it because the impact on the kids that you work with are great and it's just so fun. But I, I don't have a solution to the girls' problem with that one. Um, so the next type of engagement I want to talk about is the kind of family event. So I do quite a few kind of family events where we've got, we get people in on a Saturday and it's a coding family fun day or it's a family robot day and we get big brothers and little sisters and mothers and sons and all sorts. So we have got an Android programming one and we've got a robotics one, like a Lego robots one. And what happens is that the parents come in with the kids and they spend the whole day there and we involve the parents in the activities to a certain extent. So uh, for the robot one, we actually get the kids to write a program to program a humanoid robot to follow an assault path. And then we tell the parents that they are the humanoid robot, but they haven't got any eyes. So the kids get to sort of program their parents to walk around the room blindfold, which kind of works quite nicely as a kind of exciting activity that makes parents trip up. Um, and I think these kinds of activity are slightly more, um, slightly more useful from a kind of outreach perspective because this, they're really fun to run. Um, but perhaps most importantly, you might change the parental perceptions of what computing is about. 
and who does computing. Um, and actually, when you're thinking about who's going to be influencing the kids more, if you can change the parents' minds about what a computer scientist looks like, that's probably going to have more of an impact um, more broadly. Um, it also gives parents something to do on a damp Saturday. So after my Android programming workshop, I bumped into one of the mums in Morrison's, and she was like, she's still doing it, you know? She's still doing it. And she gets half an hour on a damp Saturday. She's not watching YouTube. She's writing Android apps. And you think, well, that's kind of cool. So that kind of giving people the opportunity to work on things on their own after the event is also very useful. Um, the, the cons of this kind of thing, you don't always make super progress because you only ever do it for a day. And a day means three hours, really, because you've got the setup and the install and the lunch break and the coffee break and the people turning up late and crowd control and somebody's laptop doesn't work. So you, you're probably looking at three hours. Um, so you don't get a huge amount done. Um, and you are generally, again, you're looking at the keen ones. You're looking at the people who have chosen to give up their Saturday to do this. They're probably either fairly keen already or they've got keen parents. Um, so there's, you're, again, you're probably not getting everybody who might be influenced in this particular situation. Although when we did the robot Mindstorms Day down in Pembrokeshire in a church hall, one of the mums ran in at the end of it and said, he just said it was the best day of his life. And I was like, wow. I don't know, what does that say about, anyway. No. Um, <laughs> so, um, I've only got one picture slide for this one because I've got hundreds of pictures of things that look just like this. Um, and what this picture's representing is actually going into schools. And I haven't got a lot of pictures of going into schools because uh, photos in schools, very difficult to take. Got to get permission, all that kind of stuff. So I get lots of photos of screens, but not necessarily of schools. Um, this is a workshop called... Um, which ba you basically make a clock in scratch, so you, they're programming the clock, they've got to work out the angles, it's got to go tick, tick, tick. They can choose their own hands, they can choose their own font for the number, they can colour things in. You get people with cars as hands or footballers or whatever. Um, and this is a workshop that I did with nine-year-olds in the local primary school. Um, and what we did is we said we wanted to do... Um, do you want us to do a coding morning? And they said, yeah, you can do all of this year. So they, they had tech all morning, so we went in and we had half the year in the first period and half the year in the second period. So we had the whole of that particular cohort. Um, and that's one of the things you can do with schools that you can't do with specific events where you're inviting people in, yeah? You can actually get everyone. You know you're getting all the girls because you're getting all of the people, yeah? So I do really, I think schools workshops and going into schools and doing that kind of just a couple of hours working through something with a whole class can be really valuable. Um, if you insist on seeing the whole class rather than a club, you do get to see everyone, obviously. Um, most schools are, are more than okay with people coming in to help out and are actually quite keen to have people come in, particularly given the current emphasis on computing in the curriculum. If you've got computing skills and you've got communication skills and you want to get involved, it's perfectly plausible to contact your local school and ask them nicely. Um, the, in the UK, DBS is a kind of major thing. So in order to go into a school, you have to have a DBS check, which means that you've been checked against the Criminal Records Bureau and everything. Um, getting a DBS check costs money. But if you register as a STEM ambassador with STEMnet, they'll sort it all out for you. So that's a top tip. If you want to go into schools, register as a STEM ambassador. They'll do the checking. You'll get a STEM ambassador's um, ID card. Um, you'll get the proper paperwork. And you'll be able to approach the school and say, look, I'm here as a STEM ambassador. And then the schools will know about this scheme. And it's all about getting scientists and technologists into schools to help with Sort of curriculum enrichment stuff. Um, teacher engagement can be hard. So quite often if you're in a school and you've got the whole class, the teacher might decide to, I don't know, go off to another room. Yet they shouldn't do this because they should be in the class with you. And one of the things that's really good is when the teacher gets involved and then is able to run the activities themselves. 
going on. I've got a couple of teachers who I work quite closely with who are able to actually carry on the workshops that we've been doing together on their own, and that's brilliant. But there are other schools I work with where I go in there, and as soon as I turn up, the teachers go and have a cup of coffee. And I, you know, obviously there's things for them to be getting on with, but it would be really nice if there was a little bit of help with crowd control, because most of my training regarding crowd control is to do with 21-year-olds, you know? <laughs> How do you calm down a class of nine-year-olds if there's not a teacher there? I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, and you can't take as many photos, but that's not really a downside. Um, so yeah, last type of event I'm going to talk about is a kind of random selection of events. And these are kind of um, doing outreach at displays and festivals and uh, one-offs in schools and so on. So these photos here are from the Eisteddfod, which is a big festival in Wales that I went to on Monday. And we've got some VR glasses and we're showing kids a roller coaster on the surface of Mars, which is kind of a cool thing to have. And what you're looking at here is encouraging, student, encouraging the kid, kids to think of something exciting, associating it with computing. But you're probably only going to have them for like five, ten minutes because they're just strolling through and they're going to stop and you've got to have something that makes them go wow for five or ten minutes. Very different to having like a, a 15 week curriculum for the robot club or a three hour session when you go into a school. Um, so uh, this is a, a shot from a really quite bonkers day called Pythagoras Day um, where we took over the local museum with a whole set of different installations and all of the schools brought their people in to look at these installations as different ways that Pythagoras influenced things. and. Um, this is actually a colleague of mine. I can't take any credit from this. Just, I, was just, I was just like holding stuff rather than designing it. But they sent a high-altitude balloon up with a local primary school um, with like Lego men in a little case that went up into space and took photographs. Um, and that's one of, another one of those kind of really big high-impact things that makes people go, oh, wow, you could do that with computers? You can see where it is? And then it was Wales, so it went out of signal, so they lost the balloon. But anyway... Um, <laughs> And um, this is, um, I was on holiday in Malawi and we went to the local school and said, can we do something? And they said, yes. And we turned up and they said, you've got all of year three and year five, which was all of the 15 year olds and all of the 13 year olds. I said, like, how many is that? And they said, 250. And we were like, okay, okay, 250 people, no computers at all. So we did the program a robot with a blindfold exercise and that was kind of cool. And that's not kind of... That's kind of more like fun um, than influencing people to go into computing as a career. But I think we probably gave them a session that they can remember, if nothing else. Um, so I'm going to finish off with some talk about a project that I've been working on, um, of things that you, you guys, if you want to go and do this stuff, you can just pick it up and take it. Um, the project is called Playful Coding. And I don't know, can you see there's a map of Europe on that slide? It looks better on that than it does on this, good. Um, so this is an EU project that's coming to, the end, coming to an end at the end of August. Oh, what a shame. And getting new EU projects is going to be complicated because... Uh... <laughs> but anyway, uh, this was very good. I was very pleased. We've done a lot of excellent work. It would be great if we could continue. There's four universities, three schools, um, one private company in... Um, UK, France, Spain, Italy, Romania, and um, we worked really closely together. We picked up workshops that I'd written, and they got run in Romania and in France and in Spain, and we ran some workshops from Romania and Wales, and we fed back, and basically there's about 20 workshops that have all been tried in four or five countries, and they've been tested by lots of people. They've been in 40, 80 different schools, They've been run with about 4,000 different kids. These are proper tried and tested activities and workshops that you can pick up and take. Um, and we wrote these all up in a book, which you can download for free from the project website. And it doesn't really read, well, it does really read like a book that's been written by 35 people with five different languages, no, six, no, seven, because there's Catalan. Anyway, but anyway, it's, it's not that bad. It's, it's, there's some useful stuff in there, even if the prose is occasionally tortured. Um, so the, the general philosophy of the project, and I had to put a picture of Seymour Paper on this slide, given that he sadly passed away just the other week, um, is that we don't like learning to code initiatives which just give the code, yeah, and just upon skills for the workplace. We think about this as something that's fun and exploratory, 
playful, teachers are facilitators, not ordering the kids what to do. Um, coding should be playful, particularly if you're looking at younger kids, particularly if you look at younger kids. So in the last three minutes of the talk, I'm going to give you three workshops that you could pick up and take away, briefly, uh, briefly describe them. So the Android Fun Day I've mentioned before, this is a one-day family workshop. Um, uses free software that's available online called App Inventor that comes out of MIT. You can write apps with it, you can get them on your phone, you can, they're not, you're not going to write the next Angry Birds, but you might write something useful. Um, you might write a, a Pong game or something, or a drawing package, or the, the, these are, all these things are possible using App Inventor. And we've run this with participants, I think the youngest we had was six, I think the oldest we had was probably 65, because we run it as a family day, so you get grandparents and parents and aunties coming in. Um, and it, it's, it's good fun. You go from nothing to having an app on your phone, and that kind of works as a real motivator for kids, because the, the very act of having mobile is itself a motivator for, for a lot of children. You want them to write an app that works on a computer program, that works on a screen, yes, all right, works on a phone, actually much more enticing. Um, this is one of the workshops that come from the Girona group, from the Early Mastery Project, the Playful Coding Project. Um, and the idea of this is you write an animation as a big group, like a class animation, and you, write, you get together and you write a story, and then each little group animates a 30-second bit with the character coming in on the left of the screen and going out on the right of the screen. You time it so that each one starts 30 seconds out of the other one, and you put the laptops in a row and you end up with an animation where the character goes all the way across between the laptops, and it works perfectly. It's such a simple idea, but you get 30 kids collaborating on something that runs across 15 different screens, and it really fits together. Um, and the other one I want to talk about is this one, because we're probably going to run it as a national contest in Wales. But the idea is you take a poem, and you get the kids to basically make a, a pop video for a poem. They write an animation where characters move around, and and highlight their stories, or, and you do it for, for nursery rhymes or for poems or something. Um, so that's that. So, five o'clock on the dot. Um, this is the link to the resources, playfulcoding.eu. If you want to have a look at it, there's a book to download, there's feedback stuff. Um, if you're in the UK, become a STEM ambassador. They'll sort your DBS check and help you go into schools and encourage your daughters and your nieces and your female relatives to have a go because it might not be for them, but if they don't have a go, they won't know that, and that's that. Um, no time for questions. <laughs>